seven years ago, a great new coffee shop opened up down the block from where I live in Nachalot, Jerusalem. Coffee lover that I am, I walked in and asked them, are you kosher? Their answer was yes, but without a certificate. Yes, because we want you and our kosher friends to be able to eat here, but without a certificate because we refuse to work with the Rabbanut. This is the story of how a cup of, a cup of coffee led to a complete change of kashrut standards in Israel and broke the monopoly of the chief Rabbanut. This is a story which has two primary insights. Number one, reliable and ethical kashrut over time can only thrive in a competitive environment. And number two, what doesn't start from the ground up will not fall from the sky. Now's a good time to explain that kashrut in Israel is a state-owned monopoly. You can only advertise yourself as kosher if you are certified to do so by the Rabbanut Rashit. No competition, no alternatives, no choice. This monopoly has created a very not kosher reality. Extortion, fraud, malpractice, bribery, and a totally substandard product and service. All these have been well documented by the press and by the state comptroller. It became clear. Behind the legal certificate of the Rabbanut, there was a lot of politics and self-interest and very little kashrut. And once you wake up and smell the coffee, it's hard to go back to sleep. It was time to change things from the ground up. Hashgacha Pratit was born. What was our operative model? Boots on the ground. Be the change. We refused to allow the restaurants to pay our supervisors like they do in the Rabbanut and insisted that we pay them to prevent conflict of interest. We were the first kashrut agency in Israel to employ women as kashrut supervisors in the field, thus becoming not only a vanguard in breaking the monopoly, but also a corrective force in gender equality and religious services. The word was out. More and more businesses were doing what they had dreamed of for years, choosing kashrut over the rabbanut. And the rabbinate began to feel the heat. Our restaurants began to receive citations. Our staff was being intimidated, but to no avail. As the underdog, we were able to be creative and flexible. We weren't allowed to issue certificates. We drafted declarations. We weren't allowed to use the word kosher. We spoke about Jewish law as it pertains to food and its preparation. <laughs> Even the word kosher with a question mark and a phone number goes a long way. We never compromised on kashrut, but we also were committed to impeccable service. The public began to see us as a vanguard of breaking the monopoly of the Rabbanut in religious services. With us, with us, you got no corruption, no arm bending, only kashrut. We saw that our idea was working, so we decided to focus on the religious Zionist community. We managed to recruit a leading kashrut authority on a national level to our, to our system. How did we do it? Well, we asked them a simple question, which we asked the customers as well. When you walk into a restaurant, what do you care about? The piece of paper on the wall or that the food be kosher? Rabbi Oren Duvdevani, joining our services, created a huge boost in public opinion and loyalty to our brand. We quickly grew to 50 locations in five major cities in Israel. For the first time, there was the beginning of a true alternative to the Rabbanut. We knew that in order to really break the monopoly, we needed hotels. We then went on to catering and industrial food production. We focused on PR, parlor meetings, flyers, lectures, events, media. And it was at that point that we began to consider what needed to be done from the top down. In 2017, after we had proven that, that ethical and reliable kashrut could only thrive in a competitive environment, the Supreme Court of Israel aligned itself with, with what we had shown to be true on the ground and opened the gateway to private kashrut in Israel. The Rabbanut refused to accept this change. It was Goliath against David. <laughs> Inspectors began visiting our restaurants multiple times a day. One restaurant in Beersheba received six citations of 1,000 shekels each in one day. The chief rabbinate responsible for 15,000 restaurants across the country was fighting a small organization with only seven part-time supervisors. We took the new fines to court and won, but then organizations aligned with Rabbanut called for a boycott of all of our locations. 
I'm happy to say that the boycott totally, totally backfired, and there was a huge wave of public support for those particular restaurants. I see somebody nodding. Probably went to Pasta Basta that week with, with many others. The public's hearts were with us and with honest kashrut. We were on a roll. Our work began to attract the attention of other organizations that were interested in giving private kashrut. And it also whet our appetite for new frontiers in the area of religion, religion and state. We drafted an exit agreement with the Tsohar rabbinic organization, the largest orthodox, modern orthodox rabbinic organization in Israel. For the first time, Tsohar would begin to provide kashrut services outside the rabbinate. As we prepared for our, for our next move, we paused to consider. Why had we succeeded where for 70 years others had not? I think it's because we are an orthodox rabbinic organization. And we're uniquely positioned to explain to the public that the monopoly of the chief rabbinut was hurting Jewish identity in Israel. The gateway which we opened cannot be closed. But kashrut is only one area in the monopoly of the rabbinut. When we turned to the public with a poll and asked what we should do next, the answer was unequivocal. Weddings, chupot, according to the law of Moses and Israel, but outside of the Rabbanut. Just as in Kashrut, the law is draconian. Two years in prison for the rabbi and the couple for an Orthodox wedding outside the Rabbanut. Just as in Kashrut, hundreds of thousands of Israelis suffer from this law. Just as in Kashrut, we are fighting the battle from within the Orthodox community. And just as in Kashrut, we will win. We're two and a half months in. Moving forward, full steam ahead. There's a multitude behind us, and by our sides, funding partners like the UJA and IREP. You are the ones that help us make change and bring tikkun in Israel. So if you ask yourselves how you can help and be part of this important change, let's grab a cup of coffee together. <laughs> Who knows what can start with one cup of coffee. Thank you.